be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of all ages. Amen. This uh, uh, first Coptic month of the year um, is uh, called the Coptic month of Tut. It's not so relevant what the name specifically is, but that this month is really dedicated to really celebrating the love of the Father for us. And um, every uh, week was the love of the Father for a different people group, the love of the Father for the saints, the love of the Father for women, the love of the Father for um, the faithful, the love of the Father for, and this week is um, the love of the Father for sinners. Um, and the gospel was uh, a part of the life of Christ where um, after synagogue, uh, the, the, one of the Pharisees, Simon the Pharisee, invites Jesus over for, you know, lunch. Um, and he, Jesus goes over to his house. And they were probably sitting in the courtyard. That's usually where one, uh, you, you know, often would entertain guests. Um, uh, it was more breezy and it was probably, you know, uh, you know nicer to sit there, um, but it was also within view of uh, the street. You know, people through the gate could see, you know, and so this this woman who was known in the town as a sinful woman, you know, probably, you know, a member of the world's oldest profession or whatnot, came and bowed herself at the feet of Christ and washed his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And Simon the Pharisee says in his mind, he says, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So Jesus answers him and he tells him, Simon, I have something to say to you. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. A denarii was about a day's wage. Um, and the other owed 50. And he forgave them both. Which of them will love him more? And Jesus and, and Simon the Pharisee says to, said to him, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Why? Because she did all of these things? Well, she did all of these things for the same reason that she is forgiven. Because she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. What gave this woman the confidence to enter the, the house of this person who was a very strict law abider, a very strict rule follower? In our household, the five of us, you know, some of us are more rule followers than others, you know, and the non-rule followers, we, we kind of like irritate the rule followers in our household because they really follow the rules. And then some of us, you know, me, my youngest, and so on, we're a little bit more kind of, you know, approximate, you know, what ought to be done. And that uh, obviously drives the others nuts, right? Well, here is a real rule follower. Simon the Pharisee was a real rule follower. And this woman, who by no means fits the mold, I mean, in no way, shape, or form, she's a woman, first of all. In, in, in Jewish society of the time, you know, you were, you were more respected as a Gentile man you know, than you were as a, as a Jewish woman. Um, we won't go into that, but needless to say, she was, you know, I clearly identified and known in society as a sinner. Um, she was 
interrupting or joining this, uh, you know, uh, private meeting to which she was not, clearly she was not invited. There was every, she had every reason to say, I ought not to go. But what made her go anyways? Something must have made her go anyways. And what the church is kind of telling us, what the church is kind of indicating to us is that what it is, is, is the love of God. It's the love of God that attracts us to him. The fear of punishment repels us from where maybe we ought not to be, sure. The desire for reward can draw us to God to a certain degree. The, the desire for reward can draw us to God to a certain degree. But there's something that can consistently draw us into Him. And that's the love of God. And many times when I encounter somebody new, I'll ask them sort of about their experiences with God and so on. Um, and sometimes we'll get into a conversation about you know, how they have or have not necessarily experienced the love of God. And no matter where this person is at in their life currently, no matter how close or far, far, far away from God they are in that place currently, their eyes will light up with a new fire, with a, with a, a new brightness, like a radiance will, will explode in their eyes when, we start to talk, when they start to tell me the story about the time they encountered the love of God themselves. And so this, this personal encounter with the love of God draws, it draws us in. But similar to this woman, <laughs> we could easily make a million excuses for ourselves of why we are unfit, why we don't deserve, why we don't belong, why um, this might work for other people, but it wouldn't work for me. I'm too far gone. I am unable. I'm sinful, and so on and so on. But do you see, do you see what the, the, the unifying factor is in all of those excuses? Like, what's the one word that came up in, in every one of those phrases of those excuses? I, me, right? That's the difference between this woman and me when I get discouraged from coming to church, from praying, from reading the Bible, from joining a Bible study or a group or something. What the, the big difference is, is that I'm focused on me. I'm focused on I. This woman was not. This woman zeroed in on Jesus and went straight for the, the goal. She went straight to Jesus. And I bet you, if her eyes would have locked with Simon the Pharisee, I bet you that there's a 50-50 chance she would have not made it to Jesus. You know, if she saw the disdain, if she saw the disgust in his face, if she saw, if she saw, if she saw, right? And the same is true for you and me. The same is true for you and me. <clears throat> so, the, and, and the issue here is that we have, we have a limited amount of, of strength or, or sort of willpower. In the psychology world, they talk about how, like, you wake up in the morning with, like, you know, a, a limited amount of willpower, and decision making is actually one of the things that wears down that willpower the most quickly, or so, so you know some sources in modern psychology seem to think. But let us suffice it to say, let us agree that there's only so much I can do. I have limited strength, and that's why the psalm that was leading to the gospel was saying that the Lord is the strength of the righteous. The righteous are not righteous because of their own strength. It's not because of their self-discipline. It's not because of their goodness. It's not because of because because. It's not because of them. It's because they figured out how to tap into a bottomless well of strength, a bottomless well of encouragement, a bottomless well of love. No matter how you spin it, at, you know, at the end of the day, the, the common denominator of all of the grace that God pours into my life is His love, right? And that's why the Coptic Church starts the, the, the calendar of readings with this theme, that God loves 
his people, all of his people, men and women, young and old, rich and poor, righteous and sinners, that the love of God, one of the uh, words that the theologians use to describe it is impassable. That means it doesn't change. That means, you know, like if you get to, uh, you know, like the, a dead end road, sometimes it say, it'll say impasse, right? Right? It's, it cannot be, it can, you can't make, there's no other side. Once you enter the ocean of God's love, there's, there's no, it's bottomless, it's endless. There's no, there's no other side. It's, he is unchangeable. He's impassable in his love. So to get real practical, what can we do? What can we do to be like this woman, to beeline it to Jesus and not get distracted, not get, you know, lost, you know, in the shuffle, right? And not, you know, really the word which is like the perfect word for our age is distracted, right? Like not get distracted from, you know, I promise you, if this woman had a smartphone, she would have never made it to Jesus, right? I'm just kidding, right? But, right, it's like a distraction machine, right? And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it is right and good to find ways to limit the amount of distraction in our lives from our phones or from whatever else and to make the reality that we're, that we're embracing today of the, of the impassable and endless love of God for me and for you that this completely disregards who I am or what I've done or where I've come from, right? To highlight that, to make that really the focus of my day. So there's a few things that I think we could all do to help to keep, you know, like Christ top of mind, his love for us top of mind every moment of every day. One of my favorite is the Jesus prayer. So we have a few things to give out to you today to kind of serve as a memory aid. I am, um, you know, from for a long, long time, I've been using these little prayer rings. These come, these are Ro Roman Catholic of origin, and they're intended to be used to pray the rosary. But, you know, I discovered them I don't know, when I was in college, and I thought to myself, gee, this is really practical. It's a lot less conspicuous than, you know, my long prayer rope. And when I'm sitting in a meeting or, or somebody's talking to me and my mind is starting to wander a little bit or this or that, I'll just take this little ring off of my finger and slide it onto another finger and I will just gently pray the Jesus prayer, one prayer per little knob. And so we'll ask one of the deacons to come around and pass that on. And maybe some of you are kind of asking, well, you know, what is the Jesus prayer and how would I go about praying that and how can you do that in the middle of, of a meeting or in the middle of something else? So maybe we'll ask one of the servants also to, to pass these out as well. These were the printed for you. There's there in, in the church, there's some in the back and there's some here in the front as well, um, as well as the prayer ropes that you see hanging on the side pews, you know, are there for praying the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer is a very, very simple prayer on the, on the cover of the pamphlet here, and it just says, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it's a simple prayer that can be repeated, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of times a day. The, the monks and nuns in the Eastern Orthodox Church will count their prayers and they'll receive a prescription to pray so, so many thousand, you know, repetitions of the Jesus prayer. And so oftentimes, um, in the middle of my day, while I'm waiting for this or I'm waiting for that or whatnot, I will, <coughs> um, I will pray the Jesus prayer. But then there's another way of praying the Jesus prayer kind of like the on-the-go way. It's oftentimes called the informal prayer of the Jesus prayer. There's something else which is really beautiful. If you take your little prayer ring, there's, you know, and you just sit in your room quietly when there's nothing else going on and, 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 and you find yourself a comfortable position, try to come to stillness somehow, you know, to bring your environment to stillness. Maybe I like to dim the lights or even turn the lights off because I don't need to see anything. Um, sit in a comfortable position or stand if you prefer, whatever is going to be comfortable for you. Take a few deep breaths in and then just repeat the prayer slowly and quietly. Lord Jesus Christ, 
Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner. And I'll do that for five minutes, just five minutes. You could do it twice a day, maybe once in the morning, once at night, just five minutes. What you will eventually realize is that you find after doing this, maybe not the first day or the second day, but within a couple of weeks for sure, you'll find a certain peace in those five minutes, a certain access to the kingdom of heaven in, in those five minutes. You'll find like you found a door to the kingdom that you can enter into. And then, to your chagrin, or mine anyways, you will go into life, into the busyness and the fret of life and the emails and the pressures and this and that and all these things that need to get done. And that kingdom of heaven is long gone, right? And I'll remember in my day, oh, the peace that I had sitting by my bedside repeating the Jesus prayer this morning. But here's the beautiful thing, is that in the busyness of my day while I'm going and I'm coming and lamenting the loss of the peace that I had, as I start to pray the Jesus prayer, in the busyness, in the psychosis and madness of the day, I'll be able to go back to that place in my room, in the quiet, in the peace, in the presence of God, and enjoy His presence in the middle of the madness, in the middle of the marketplace of life, you know, with the, all, all what's going on, right? And so somehow there is, there is some relationship between the informal prayer of the Jesus prayer that we pray in the madness of life and the busyness of life and the quiet that we pray it in our room. But it takes a little bit of practice. It's not from day one. But, but honestly, honestly, from a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks of just for five minutes every morning or every night um, of, of, of this quiet prayer in conjunction with praying the Jesus prayer throughout the day. And this helps Jesus to be top of mind. In fact, what ends up happening is that Jesus' name ends up at the tip of my tongue all the time, right? And previously, when I would stub my toe, I'd say like, oh, and, you know, what pick your four-letter word of choice that ought not to be repeated in church or anywhere else, right? And then all of a sudden, it becomes, oh, Jesus, right? Which could be a swear word, or it could be a prayer. It could be a prayer. It could be a conditioning, a conditioning that when I don't know what to say, I cry out to him, and I cry out in his name. How beautiful is that? You want to know something else that's really beautiful? Within about six weeks or two months of doing this, if you actually do what I'm saying, mostly every day. Nobody does everything every day, but, you know, to the best of your ability. Within about six weeks or so, oftentimes people will tell me, and I've encountered this as well myself, you wake up in the morning and, the, and, and you find yourself saying, have mercy on me, the sinner. Like you're halfway through the prayer. Like when did that happen? Who, 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 who initiated that, right? And you start to realize that while you're conscious or not conscious, not, you know, by some cognitive action of yours, the prayer is, has now sprouted in your heart, has taken root in your heart, and is now bearing fruits of more prayer, whether you're aware of it or unaware of it, whether you're conscious of it or not conscious of it. All of this helps us to take our attention off of myself, my weakness, my inability, my problems, me, 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 and turn my attention to Jesus. Then I really like these visible reminders, right? I, I, I do this everywhere I go. Um, when I had an office in the hospital, I would hang pictures in it. I would hang like the verse that I read in my quiet time that day. I'd like, you know, just print it out 
you know, from whatever tribal gateway or whatever, something, and stick it up on the wall and so on. I shared my office with another guy. His side of the office was clean and tidy. Mine was plastered with stuff. The walls were covered, right? And when the people who report to me would walk into my office, they'd, they'd, be, they'd, be, they'd be surprised. And I'd tell them, you got to keep whatever is most important to you before your eyes always. A lot of people will have a picture of their family, of their children, of their wife, so that they keep them top of mind while they're at work. Great, that's wonderful. Do that too if you want, right? But for me, I felt it was most critical that I would have post-it notes with, with Bible verses. Many, many of my, like, you know, beloved that are here, right? I see you do that. Like on your laptop screen, there will be, you know, a post-it note with a Bible verse or with something redirecting us back, uh, back to Christ, right? And then the last thing is a little phrase that I learned from a friend of mine. Not me, but the grace of God in me. It comes from the Pauline epistle. St. Paul is the one who says it. But I have a friend who used to say that, and he used to say it all the time. If you said to him, if you told him thank you, or if you complimented him about something, or even if he was talking about one of his failures, he would, you would find whether it was good, something good, or something bad, he would find him saying, not me, but the grace of God in me. And so if we can find gentle, simple, effective, small, repetitive ways of redirecting our eyes towards Christ, we can be like this woman who finds her strength in God to run to Christ and pour herself out over him, her tears, her hair, her fragrant oil. She gives it all to Christ. And Christ honors her because she loved much. May you and I do go and do the same. Glory be to God forever and ever and ever.